Okay. Okay. Now, now we can finally start, I guess. Okay. Again. Uh, okay. Uh, shorter version: geometry and topology. Very interesting. Understanding their interaction. Um, um, yeah. So I guess the, the 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 tool that I want to explore a little bit in these three lecture is the uh, the, the the Dirac operators. Okay. So Dirac operators. Okay, so, and I guess the, the, the way, uh, the thing I want to discuss a little bit today is like what Dirac operators are and how you can somehow relate um, uh, them to these two fields. So, so we already see some nice interaction today between geometry and topology. And uh, just uh, as, a, as a warning, so here it's really uh, the analysis uh, of Dirac operators uh, that comes into uh, play. I'll be very sloppy with the analysis. I want to focus more on the interactions. So I'll say maybe something which is imprecise, but you know nothing false. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So let, let's start uh, with what Dirac operators are. So uh, yeah. So I guess uh, before starting uh, to talk about Dirac operators, let me just kind of remind you that the, the essentially the most fundamental operator. Uh, on Rn uh, is the Laplacian. Okay, this is the Laplacian. Okay, and uh, well, maybe you're used to seeing the one with the pluses, uh, but uh, I prefer the one with the minuses because this is the positive one. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, we'll, we'll, you know, uh, th this is better for geometries in some sense. Um, yeah, in particular, you know, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the solutions to these equations are called harmonic functions. Okay, and they're very important uh, objects. For example, they, they come up everywhere like in physics or even, uh, you know, for example, the, the potential in electromagnetism or stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, the study of harmonic function is a very important topic of um, study in, in, in geometry. Okay, uh, yeah, so I guess the idea is that, you know, this is uh, very nice. Uh, it's a second order operator, it involves second derivatives. And I guess uh, Dirac, um, in 1928, asked, asked himself uh, um, uh, uh, I guess what, what, what he asked himself is that he wanted a first order operator D such that D square is uh, uh, the Laplace. Okay, he was motivated by trying to study the uh, the quantum mechanics of electrons and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I guess from, from our perspective, it's just, well, can you find some operator that squares to the Laplace? Okay, and of course, you know, even from a very basic perspective, it's very nice to have a first order equation because it's much easier than a second order equation. Okay, uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, uh, just to be very, um, so, you know, to be our first guess, so suppose, uh, let's try, you know, he was guessing well how such an operator d might look like, so let's guess. Uh, you know, let's say d has the form a1 d in dx1 plus a2 d in dx2 plus plus a n d in dxn. Okay, and a n let's say let's say a n are constant. Okay, so let's say, you know, for simplicity, let's try the simplest thing you can try, you know, just write a general differential operator first order with some constant coefficients. Well, and now let's, let's set, you know, this is the equation we want uh, to satisfy. I guess I want this one, so let's set it up. So, yeah, so if you write uh, the square of this, well, we're assuming that AI are constant, so 
So this squared turns out to be, you know, the sum of ai squared, d squared, d phi squared, uh, plus the sum of ai aj, d um, squared, phi, d, d, d x, j. Okay, so over i and j. Okay, so if you want this to be uh, um, sum of minus d square, the x i square, you get a system of equations, which is um, a i square equals uh, minus one. And uh, well, the derivatives commute, so uh, what you get is that you know the x i the x j is the same as the x j the x i. So, and the ter does not turn with mixed derivatives here. So what you get here is that ai aj plus aj ai is zero if i is deep in j. Okay, so this is a very easy, um, simple uh, idea. Uh, yeah, so let's see uh, if we can solve this equation somehow. Okay, so uh, yeah, so if n equals one, oops, is n equals one, uh, well, uh, you know, I just want, you know, I, it, it's, it, it's very easy, so you just want something uh, a1 squared equals minus one. Okay, uh, yeah, so, you know, you cannot do this in real number, I guess this we learned in high school, but you can do it in complex numbers, right? Um, so yeah, it's very nice because then you can set uh, ai equals i as a complex number, okay, and then you can get your, the, the, the operator you want. So this is called the Dirac operator, D. This is I in D, D, D. Okay, so we're happy with this. Uh, yeah, so this is, and you can check easily that if you square this, you get minus first derivative square, the second derivative, the index one square. Okay, uh, yeah, and if n equals two, well, things that's a little more interesting, right? Because, um, well, this is saying that, uh, you know, a1, a2 is minus a2, a1. Okay, so this, you cannot solve, you know, if, if you work with complex numbers, you cannot solve this, just because, well, complex numbers are commutative, and, you know, well, well this implies that they're non-zero. So it seems like you kind of, you know, uh, there's no solutions of these such uh, equations in complex numbers. But the Dirac, Dirac's idea is like, um, well, you can solve this if you, you look at more complicated algebraic structures. And in particular, you can look at two by two matrices. So you can set, um, yeah, you can set, for example, A1 uh, equals uh, zero minus one, uh, one, zero, and A2, Okay, and they satisfy the equations you want. Okay, so then your Dirac operator uh, turns out to be, um, you know, a1 d in dx1 um, plus h2. Um, yeah, and this is just um, zero, um, minus d in dx1 plus i. D in two, uh, D one plus I D in two and zero. Okay, and you can check that these squares to the Laplacian. If you you know we so here at the beginning we're thinking of the Laplacian acting on functions, uh, but you know it turns out that the Laplacian has a square root if you think of it as having values in C two valid functions. So. Okay, so if you try to write a, a square root uh, of the Laplacian on function, you, you fail. Uh, but it's nice because, you know, d squared equals Laplacian acting on C2 valid function.
Sorry, can you? Uh, yeah, so I guess the question is like, how do you go back here? Yeah, instead of thinking u as a, like a function, I just think of it as a, as a column vector, for example. Yeah, so it's a C2, you know, uh, more, more than yeah, uh, a vector valid function. Yeah, so this is exactly what we got. So I guess the, the idea is that, you know, you, you have to move on from functions, um, number valid functions. If you move on with vector valid function, then you can find a square root. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, you know, just to keep on going, let me tell you. Maybe I write them here, and uh, uh, they'll be. Uh, and yeah, yeah, just as a reminder, you know, just uh, just to point out, this, these things very, look very closely to uh, you know the anti-holomorphic and holomorphic derivative of a function, right? So uh, yeah, so the Dirac operator in n equals two dimension is very close to uh, holomorphic geometry. Okay, so this is more or less, you know, depending on your convention, this is more or less. The L bar and the the, L and the L bar. Okay, so uh, there's some very interesting relation between these natural Dirac operators and holomorphic geometry. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll leave it here. So uh, I guess uh, uh, D is I, D is D is one, n equals two. I'll leave it here for later. Two, D in DX1 plus I, DX2, zero. And then if you want N equals three, well, we go back to the, we, we got the famous Pauli matrices. Uh, so um, you get sigma one is uh, I zero, zero minus one, sorry, A one. A two is, uh, zero minus one, one zero, and a three is zero i i zero. Okay, so this is a solution again in two by two matrices. You can solve what we want. Uh, it's i's. Yeah. 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 So we wanted to square to minus one. So this this this, this does the job, and then n equals four. Uh, can people see here? I guess you can see from there, right? Uh, yeah, you you get some matrices. You, know, you, you need four matrices, and you, what, what you do is just you look at four by four matrices with blocks. So you get minus the identity, identity, zero. Okay, so this is one, and the other are obtained by these AIs in some way. So minus AI, AI zero. Okay, these are tra this means transpose conjugated star. Okay, so once you get to four by four things, uh, you cannot find solutions in two by two matrices anymore, but you, know, you can solve it using four by four matrices. And the four by four matrices has, have this nice block structure. Okay, and you know, if you, if you look at this, maybe at some point you can guess how to get five, six, and so on. You just keep on blocking things, putting blocks of blocks of blocks. Okay. Uh, any question? Oh, I guess, uh, well, oh, sorry. So I guess the, the original question is why do we want this? Uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to say silly things because we're in a theoretical physics building and I'm not a theoretical <laughs> physicist. I think, yeah, so to, to, to find the relativistic quantum mechanics, you need a first order equation. Uh, so he wanted something which was related to the Laplacian but was a first order equation. So actually his paper, uh, original paper from 1928 is very readable, so I suggest it's very nice. He uses the same notation we use today, essentially, so it's right. So it's one of the few 100 year papers, old, old papers that still very modern, yeah. Uh, so the question is like, well, what's the dimension you need? Uh, yes, uh, so actually every two, every time you go up, you know, uh, you, you multiply by two and then you stay the same, you multiply by two, you stay the same. So I think it's two to the 
floor of n divided by two or something like that. I, I'll, I'll say more formally what the, the thing is, yeah. Uh, but yeah, just draw the, the first few low dimensional cases just to show you, you know, the Jacob operator, usually people introduce them by, oh, spin bundle, Clifford algebra. It's something super concrete. You just write down the matrices and, you know, you work with those, yeah. Yeah, so I won't talk about spin bundles and Clifford algebra at all. It's, it's just, it's, um, but yeah, you can think of, yeah, so uh, this is, uh, yeah, in some sense, you know, this, this is, I, I wrote down a solution to this problem, uh, but it's of course not the unique one, but this is in some sense the minimal one, so in a specific sense. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, so, so the question, uh, I guess the people in the chat can read that, so I don't have to repeat that. I have to repeat for them, okay. Uh, yeah, so the question is like, yeah, any operator which is, this is positive, because, uh, so you can find uh, square root in the functional calculus sense. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's much nicer to work with differential operators, because those are more close, we'll see that that will be much more closely related to geometry. I guess that's the, the answer, yeah. But yeah, of course. Uh, because it's an operator, you know, uh, which, uh, which is positive, the Laplace and it has a square root as, as a pseudo differential operator. But you know, that's hard to, yeah. Uh. Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, yeah. Let's move on then. Uh, yeah. So let's keep this in mind. Uh, yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll erase this something here. Um, yeah, so we, we have these Dirac operators, so you know, I just wanted to say uh, it's something super concrete. Uh, and this, but this is in Rn, so let me tell you what, what happens on a manifold, okay? So I'll just tell you the formal properties, and you should think of it, oh, it's something that you know, has these formal properties as, and looks something like this at each point, okay? So this is, uh, we'll go to, uh, yeah, so Dirac operators. Manifolds. Yeah, so the actual definition uh, I was mentioning, I guess, uh, it, it's pretty complicated. You know, I would have to spend probably the all the three hours just to define the Dirac operators properly. But yeah, let me just tell you like the formal properties of, 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 um, of, of what happens on a, on a manifold. So this is a Riemannian manifold. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, we'll, assume, we'll choose a spin structure, okay? So uh, uh, choose a spin structure, uh, suppose, it admits a spin structure. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I won't even define what a spin structure is. It's something about taking uh, square roots of your bundle, which is you know it, it makes sense because here we're somehow taking square roots of your most fundamental operator on your manifold, the Laplacian. Um, but yeah, let me let me uh, tell you uh, what. what how to check if a manifold admits a spin structure. Um, uh, so this, uh, this is if and only if uh, the second Stiefel Whitney class of your of the tangent bundle, which is an element in H2 of uh, N with two coefficients, uh, vanishes. Okay, so it's a very uh, easy thing to check if you're so uh, manifold is spin, you know, for example, if the tangent bundle is trivial, then you admit a spin structure. Um, and yeah, uh, and it's equivalent. So if uh, and the dimension of your manifold is at least three, uh, this is equivalent to uh, EM restricted to the two skeleton uh, is trivial. Okay, uh, yeah, so this is it. So we'll always assume that there is a spin structure. It's not unique, so the, the, the operator will write out, will depend on which uh, spin structure we, we, we choose. Okay, Mark. Okay, so let me just tell you what uh, formally the Dirac operator is then. Uh, 
Um, oh yeah, by the way, I typed out notes for these uh, lectures and I'll post uh, them uh, afterwards, uh, to, by, uh, this afternoon, I guess, uh, or right after class on my website. Um, yeah, so the, the, the lecture notes are more or less a transcription of what I written with some more detail and references and maybe point out some details that are important but I don't have, I'm, I'm not going to say in class. Okay, so what, uh, what does the speed structure give us? Well, uh, I guess the Dirac operator had this thing that it had the target space, uh, you know, we're looking not at functions but CM valued functions. So in general on a manifold that would correspond to some kind of bundle. Uh, okay, so this gives us, um, the analog of uh, the C to the M target spaces. Okay, so what is this? Well, this is a bundle. So this is a S over M. This is a, a Hermitian bundle. of rank um, um, so it gives you the, the dimension we're discussing, so two to the n over two. Okay, so if n equals one, it's a, 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 like a one dimensional, so here it's C. Uh, so here the target space was C. I guess it's the same color, this is C2, C2, and C4, okay? Yes. Um, yeah, and this also comes with a connection, so this is a Hermitian. Okay, so uh, once you have a bundle, you know, we're not in RN anymore, so the, you, you need a way to talk about how the fibers relate to each other, and that's a connection. Um, yeah, and that, that's determined by the metric. And then you, you have the Dirac operator. Uh, and the Dirac operator is an operator a D from sections of S to sections of S. Okay? Yeah, so you know, this is a little more abstract, but you know, really, it, it, if, if you get lost, you should always think, oh, this is the same thing that we saw in our end. So we have our operation, our operator uh, between section of this bundle. In, in, in our end, it's just a trivial bundle, so it's CM valued functions. And then, you know, there's a standard derivative, and, you know, the rank is what it is. Okay? Yes. And yeah, and you know, um, if, you, if you're careful, in some sense, in local coordinates, this operator in low dimension looks exactly like uh, this, these operators that I wrote before. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, so the question is like, where is this bundle coming from? And the question is like, locally, it's uh, essentially exactly what I wrote here. Uh, the problem is that you, to do it globally, you need uh, to make it make sense of it globally. You need to be very careful, and that's where the spin structure comes into play. Unfortunately, I won't have time to tell you where the bundle comes from, but yeah, uh, uh, th there's very detailed references that in the notes. So if, you, if you're interested, you can look at them. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I guess the bundle is like you know, if you try to glue this uh, the, this. Yeah, the bundle, so here, yeah, I always think of M. And, oh, sorry, what, what does the, the question is like, what does the bundle depend on? Yeah, it depends on the, the manifold, and I guess the, the extra data depends on the metric too, and the choice of the spin structure, yeah. So this is an object associated to a spin Riemannian manifold. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, let me tell you two key properties uh, of the Dirac operator. 
so two key properties. Okay, so first of all, um, it is uh, formally self-adjoint. Okay, so what does this mean? It means it, it's essentially you should think of it as a symmetric matrix. So if you pick two sections of your bundle, which are compactly supported, for example, if the manifold is compact, then, um, so if you do d phi psi, the L2, so you know, you take the inner product, and integrate it over the whole manifold. So maybe let me put it here. Uh, so you know, S is a Hermitian bundle, so you can take inner product of things. So we denote phi, phi prime, L2, this is the integral of Okay, this is, you know, it's a symmetric matrix, so you can bring the D to the other side. Okay, it's a fun exercise in integration by parts to show that this is true for the operators I drew uh, down there. And this is also integration by parts. Okay, and then uh, a more important, well, I guess another very important property is that uh, it is elliptic. Okay, so this is a very important analytical property of, a, of the equation. I won't define, okay, won't define. Okay, but we will use a lot the consequences of this ellipticity. So, for example, a very important uh, cons key consequence, for example, um, is that, you know, uh, if d phi equals zero, okay, so if you have a solution to the, to the, to the Dirac equation, so this equation here, so, this is like phi is the harmonic. Okay, in the same sense, in the same way that if you have a function whose Laplacian is zero, called a harmonic function. This is, oh, I didn't, I didn't give the name to this S. This is called a spinor bundle. Okay, so the sections are what we call spinors, and this is a harmonic spinor. Okay, so you know, D is a first order operator. So for this equation to make sense, you need to be able to take one derivative and that's enough. Okay, so this makes sense. For example, for, uh, for a C1 function. Okay, so you know, if you, if you have differentiable, maybe with continuous derivative, then this equation makes sense. The very cool thing is that if this is true, then you're, you're automatically a smooth, a smooth. Okay, so this is one of the key proper, you know, uh, it means that it's a very nice equation. You know, in general, this is not true. You know, if you write a, di a gen random differential operator, it's not true that a C1 solution is necessarily smooth, but this is true, and you know, uh, Maybe because of what I said, it uh, shouldn't be too surprising for you. You should compare this. Uh, well, this is true, for example, for the del bar equation. This is what we learn in complex analysis that holomorphic functions are necessarily smooth, okay? Even if, you know, the definition, you really use very few properties. And also for the Laplacian. So harmonic functions also have this property. And spinors are kind of closely related, so, so this is not too surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you square it, it's, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I guess uh, the question is, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, it wasn't a query, it was more like a, com like a yeah. Uh, is that the, the, the fact that this is true for the Laplacian implies this for the Dirac, essentially. Uh, yeah, so that's true in Rn. In, on a manifold, 
we'll see that this square is not exactly the Laplacian, but it's very close. So uh, yeah, from what I said later, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other question? Okay. Uh, yeah. So now we're, you know, this is our uh, gadget. This is, our, 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 this is the tool that will allow us to somehow connect geometry and topology on a manifold. Okay, so let me just, uh, let me start by telling you how this can be related to um, uh, topology. Okay, so well, another key property uh, of ellipticity um, is that also implies uh, another key property that if uh, on a compact manifold, uh, then care D, okay, so this is the file in the space of harmonic spinors, uh, is finite dimensional. Okay, this is not true for the general operator. So, you know, if I give you a random differential operator, the space of solution, you know, there's no reason for it to be finite dimensional. But this is true for you know, general elliptic operators on a compact manifold. So, yes, in particular, you get some numbers out of your operator, which is some dimension. And it turns out that that number, which is obtained in this analytic way, so trying to solve some differential equation, uh, is very closely related to the topology of the manifold you started with. Okay, so. Yeah, so we need a little bit more uh, to, to state what the relation actually is. Uh, um, I, I need to tell you a little more about uh, a little bit of structure. Um, yeah, so uh, now let's assume an even. Okay, so for the first uh, two lectures, I will mostly talk about the n even dimensional case. And then we'll switch to our favorite dimension, which is three. Uh, and then, of course, we have to go to n odd uh, in the last lecture. Um, but yeah, let's look at n even uh, what happens. Yeah, so it, it's very interesting. So, you know, n odd, you know, there's this uh, diagonal term. So, but, you know, if you look at n even, uh, the diagonal terms are always zero. So here is also always zero. Okay, and uh, so, the, so the Dirac operator uh, somehow splits in two parts and, you know, just, and only has off diagonal terms. Okay, so you also here, if you write down explicitly what it is, there will also be somehow the decomposition in two pieces and the operators exchanges the two pieces. Okay, so when n is even, um, your bundle splits. Uh, There's some natural splitting. So th that's the case of our n, and it actually it holds also on a general manifold that your bundle splits. Okay, and your Dirac operator, uh, you can decompose it as a block, in two blocks. Zero, D minus, D plus, and zero. Okay, so you should keep in mind, uh, you know, the case n equals two that I wrote out explicitly. Okay, so the Dirac operator, you can write it as these blocks with zeros and two of, of the diagonal terms. And this, um, yeah, so you have, um, you know, sections of this bundle plus and section of this bundle minus, and this is D plus, and this is uh, minus. Okay, and these are called uh, the chiral rock operators. Yeah, so now, um, um, because D is a joint, sorry, D is self a joint, okay, so because D is a symmetric matrix, uh, it means that D plus and D minus are adjoined to each other. OK, 
Okay, so in some sense, um, you know, d plus phi psi uh, do this uh, phi d minus psi. Okay, so well, they're not self-adjoint because you know they don't even go to, from the same place to the other, but somehow they're one of the transpose of the other. Okay, uh, yeah. So if you are uh, so and now. Oh yeah, sorry, this is L2, yeah, thanks. Yeah, the question is like, should we integrate? And the yeah, answer is yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so uh, in particular, you know, if you remember from linear algebra, um, so the, if you have a matrix, then the image of the matrix, the orthogonal, this is the kernel of the transpose. Okay, so this, in, in our situation, no, this still holds in this situation, and we get that um, the dimension of the co-kernel of D plus, um, so the, everything modulo the image of, of D plus, this is the dimension of the kernel of D minus. Okay, so this is, uh, and this is finite. Okay, because, well, the kernel of D minus is contained in the kernel D plus. So, uh, and these are all finite. So we can form this quantity, uh, I guess definition, the index of D plus is index of D plus. This is the dimension of the kernel of D plus minus the dimension of the kernel of D minus. Sorry, well, I guess it's called kernel of D plus. Okay, and this is a natural number. Okay, so here we use ellipticity in a very, very strong way. In general, neither of these two numbers is finite. But in this case, because of ellipticity, I'm in a, on a compact manifold, so from now on, I'll always work with compact manifolds, this turns out to be an integer. Okay, so what's the, what's the magic here? Um, yeah, so the, the point here is that uh, these two things, these are not invariants of, you know, M, G, and spin structure. Okay, so if you, you know, manifold is what it is, but if you change the metric and the spin structure, so maybe. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, uh, under changes of G. So if you change the metric, it's not a topological invariant. So the dimension of the kernel of the operator and the dimension of the co-kernel of the operator, they are not invariants of the many. They're not topological invariants. So you know, our goal is to somehow understand interaction between topology and geometry. So these quantities separately, they're not good uh, objects to study, just because if you change the metric, you get something different. Okay, but the miracle is that this index, it is, it is an invariant. Okay, and there's a formula for it in terms of characteristic classes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so let me write this formula. So this is uh, a very special case of the, oh, sorry, um, the, the Atiyah Singer index theorem um, to the, uh, apply to the case of um, um, Dirac operators. Yes, this is 
uh, this theorem. So this is due to a Tia and Singer. Okay, so the under assumption we have, so I'm a compact spin manifold, uh, then the index, uh, so the index of D plus, which is a integer, okay, and it's an analytic quantity because, you know, to compute it in principle, you know, you need to solve the Dirac equation, find the space of solutions and compute dimensions. So this is an analytic quantity. This is analysis. Okay, uh, can be computed uh, in terms of uh, the Pontryagin numbers. Okay. These are Pontryagin classes. Yeah, a question? What, sorry? Uh, yeah, so the question is like, what happens with spin instead of spin C? Well, spin C depends on an extra line bundle. Uh, yeah, uh, th there's a more complicated formula, so uh, I'll just stick with the simplest case, yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, I guess the idea is that for any elliptic operator, there's a formula. So yeah, uh, sorry, there was someone in the back first. Yeah. Uh, it turns out it, it's the same. Uh, I read the formula, and then it will show that it doesn't depend on the spin structure. Yeah. Sorry. The question is like, does the index depend on the choice of spin structure? And the answer is no. But there's no a priori reason. It's just the formula doesn't involve the spin structure. Yeah, in the case of spin C, the question, yeah. But in the case of spin C structure, it depends on which spin C structure you pick, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's very cool. Uh, the, this theorem is very cool because it relates analysis on one side. And here you have topology. You know, Pontryagin classes are topologically invariant of your, of your manifold. So somehow, this is the, the way, the, the thing that will allow us the first step, going from topology to analysis. And let me just tell you a little bit of formulas. So n equals 2, well, then the index is always zero. So n equals 2 mod 4. OK, so 2, 6, 10. So somehow nothing interesting happens. Um, so if n equals 4, well, the, the index is minus uh, the first Pontryagin class um, of Tm. So it, this lives in H4. So we can evaluate it on the top class and then divided by 24. OK, and you know, for, for a four manifold, the Pontryagin class is related to the classical signature. So you can also get, you know, by Hirzebruck, here you get to minus signature of m divided by 8. OK, so the index of the Dirac operator uh, is related to the signature. And you know, there, there's crazy formulas going on, so I'll just Write the next one. If n equals eight, the index is um, uh, minus four p two plus seven p one squared. So this is a class in H upper eight. So you can evaluate it on the fundamental class of M, and then you divide by five thousand seven hundred sixty. Okay. So you know it's already very non-trivial that this number here is divisible by five thousand seven hundred sixty. So you can, you can get a lot of interesting divisibility for Pontryagin classes and a lot of cool theorems uh, just by using the fact that this turns out to be an integer. Question there? Uh, yeah, so the question is, like, is there a homotopy invariant? So I always forget the statement that the Pontryagin classes, rational Pontryagin classes are homotopy invariants, right? That's Novikov something. So yeah, they're, ration, they're homotopy, I guess Paul is, uh, okay, yeah, they're homotopy invariant. <laughs> yeah. The, the integral ones are not, right? But the rational ones are, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, 
Any other question? Oh, uh, uh, the question is like, why do I index define for d plus? Well, you can define it for d minus. They're adjoined to each other, so uh, the index of d minus is minus index of d plus. So yeah, so one of them is the, you just need one of them, yeah. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so I won't have, this is one of the, you know, the T.S. Singer index theorem is one of the most important theorems of the last century, and I'm not, yeah, you know, I don't have time to discuss anything here other than the formulas that you get. So, but yeah, I'll, there's uh, references in the, in the notes if you're interested in learning more about it. Okay, so this was the link, you know, we, we, our goal was going from topology to a geometry and somehow we manage using the Tessinger index theorem to get to analysis. So now let me tell you how to get from harmonic spinners, uh, analysis, to geometry. Okay, so um, yeah, so now this brings us back to the beginning of the lecture. So, um, so, uh, so Dirac uh, operators versus geometry. Okay, so recall uh, the Dirac's motivation. Uh, was we want uh, d square equals, we want something that squares to the Laplacian, right? Uh, and uh, in our n. Okay, so Dirac, the, the, the place we started with is that Dirac wanted an operator that squares to the Laplacian um, in our n. Uh, and yeah, so somehow, well, we, we did a lot of steps, right? So we, we wrote it down in our end, and then I told you, oh, you can do the same thing on a manifold. But it's not clear now that, you know, what, what this even means and if it's true on a manifold, okay? So in fact, it's almost true, uh, but we, I need to tell you in which sense it's true. So on a manifold. Okay, so on a manifold, what, what's the Laplacian, first of all? Um, well, the Laplacian... Uh, you can think of it, you know, Laplacian on Rn is minus the divergence uh, composed with uh, the gradient okay. uh, in Rn. Okay, so uh, to make sense of this, I need to tell you what the divergence and the gradient are on a, on a manifold. Well, so the gradient, you know, uh, so this is, um, you know, we have our connection on our bundle, so that's the analog of the gradient. Um, Okay, so connection picks sections of your bundle and spits out one forms uh, with values in your bundle. Okay, so this is your connection. And this is, the, uh, you can think of the connection as the analog, uh, the bundle analog of the gradient. Okay, so this is. Um, the analog of the gradient. Uh, yeah, I guess again, uh, the very nice thing is that the divergence is the adjoint of the gradient in the integration by part sense. So you can take, uh, you can define simply by thinking uh, this is the adjoint, formal adjoint of delta, nabla. Okay, and this is the analog of minus. Uh, divergence. Okay, so when you integrate by parts, you remember that there's always a minus sign that pops out, which is now, which is annoying, and that's why we we in include them in our formulas, so you don't have to worry. So yeah, no, very very concretely, what this means is that. Um, uh, so I, I keep on looking for erasers, but then I just. <clears throat> So, uh, so what, what this means, you know, again, L2 adjoint means that, you know, uh, nabla phi alpha L2, this is phi nabla star alpha for every phi in section of 
SOS, and I'll find the section. So, all right, SOS. Okay, so it's a, you define it by integration by parts, and this is uh, true in our end. If you replace this by gradient, and this by divergence. Okay, that's integration by parts. Okay, and in particular, you know, this expression, uh, we can define the Laplacian. Uh, so, you know, if you do nabla to go here, and nabla star, you go back to the original place you start with. So, uh, this is our, the analog of our Laplacian um, from sections of S. Okay, so this is the analog of the Laplacian on your bundle. So this makes sense, you know, this here, I didn't use, uh, okay, I didn't use anything about the bundle itself, you know, the spinner bundle. This, this, you can make this operator for any Hermitian bundle with a Hermitian connection, or like, yeah. So then this is usually called the, the Bochner Laplacian. Or Roth Laplacian. Okay? Yeah, so this is the natural Laplacian on any bundle or with a connection, compatible with the metric. Um, yeah, so the key result uh, that connects uh, um, um, the analysis of the Dirac operator with uh, uh, geometry is the following version of this. Uh, for uh, a, a, a manifold. So this is a theorem due to Nerovitz. Oh, yeah, by the way, I didn't, I didn't give you the time frame. This is all stuff that happened in the 60s, more or less. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so this formula is almost true, uh, but not quite. So there's a you know, when you take squares, there's always second derivatives. And on a manifold, you know, unlike Rn, second derivatives don't commute on a manifold. So you can expect that when you do things, there's some curvature term popping out. And it, it turns out that the, the actual formula is very nice. So this is this. So you can think of, you know, this is exactly the formula. But then you have some correction, which is given by the scalar curvature of your manifold. Oh, so the question is like, is there a, a nice proof of this theorem? Uh, I think, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, that you, either you just write out, I think we, we talk about with this Oris a lot. I think by pure thought, maybe one can try to figure out some just symmetries of tensors and stuff. One might figure out that it's related to the scalar curvature somehow, and that's the only thing. I, I haven't tried that though yet. But I guess, I don't know how to guess the over four though from that, uh, so. You, you might be able to somehow figure out that it only depends on the scalar curvature, but then. Yeah, I guess that's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I haven't tried though, so there might be a way. Um, yeah, so, okay, I, I won't do the computation for you. I guess I, I don't need to define properly the Dirac operators. Um, but yeah, so why, why is this interesting? I think, you know, th this is a very, uh, you know, it seems like a very innocent formula. Um, but I think what's the magic behind this formula? Um, so the magic, um, so you know, we were looking for a square root of the Laplacian, so it's not surprising that, you know, so d squared uh, and nabla star nabla are second order operators. Um, uh, with the, spur, with the same second order part uh, by design. Okay, so we were looking for an operator that squares to the plus in Rn, so you know, it's not surprising that the second order parts are the same. But if you take the difference of two operators which are the same second order parts, you know, you expect that to be a first order operator, okay? Uh, Um, uh, is in principle 
first order. Okay, but the magic is that the first order term is zero. Okay, so this is a zeroth order term. It's multiplication by the scalar curvature. Okay, and now you'll see that, you know, in the argument I'll give you that if you had a first order part, then things wouldn't work out nicely at all. Okay, so this is really the magic. Okay, so the magic part is some magic cancellation of first order terms. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, no, S is just uh, the, the actual scalar curve. It's a function, yeah. Okay, that's it. What was the second? Oh, the, the second question was, can you stand over this board? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, yeah, any other question while I stand in front of this board? I guess I need to erase this board anyway, so I guess. Oh, uh, well, I guess. Um, maybe I should leave. Well. Yeah, sorry. I guess, well, it's a good place because I forgot to the general statement, so <laughs> it's a good place to, to write it. Um, yeah, so I guess um, we said that the index d plus is zero if uh, n is two mod four. And in general, it's a combination, you know, I wrote the formula for n equals four and n equals eight, but in general, there is this crazy expression in the Pontchagin class, it's called the a hat genus. This is called this is a, a hat, this is called a hat genus. This is an expression in um, PI of TM that you can write out if you want. Okay, so let me put these two things together. I guess it's uh, I guess it's nice. I'll just erase the middle board and hopefully things do. Uh, so yeah, I guess. So yeah, you can think of this somehow relate uh, differential operators, so analysis, to geometry. So you can think of this as analysis, geometry. Okay, so if we put these two things together, we get a relation between geometry and topology as follows. So I guess this is the following theorem. So suppose, uh, so mg, a compact spin manifold um, 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 and suppose that the scalar curvature is positive everywhere. So they will say positive scalar curvature. Okay, then the index of d plus is zero. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, so in particular, for example, a g, if uh, uh, it's a four dimensional, uh, then, you know, the index of d plus, we know that it, well, I raised it, but it was a signature, uh, then the signature is zero. Okay, so for example, you know, this is, in general, you know, there's a, very, a lot of metrics you can study on a, on a Riemannian manifold, and, you know, it's easy, it's relatively easy to give uh, constraints on the geometry of positive uh, sectional curvature and positive Ricci curvature, but scalar curvature is very hard to, to, to study. And in particular, I think this is, was the, one of the first, in, the, probably the first instance in which you can give topological obstructions to the existence of this positive scalar curvature. Metric. So, for example, you know, uh, there's this uh, famous four-dimensional manifold, which is called the K3 surface, 
uh, this is spin and has the signature equals minus 16. Uh, then, uh, uh, so no PSC metric on the K3 surface. Yes? How about CP2? Yes, that was my, uh, what about CP2? Yeah, that's my next example. So example uh, CP2 uh, has signature, signature equals one uh, and has uh, has a PSC metric. Um, okay, the, the Fubini Studi metric. Uh, yeah, so uh, why, is it a, why this is not a counterexample to the theorem? Yeah, uh, it's not spin. CP2 is not a spin manifold. Okay, so this is a very sharp theorem. You really need to use spin structures to, to spin manifold. Yes. Um, yes, in particular, you know, uh, if you write, let me rewrite this theorem uh, using the, the previous one. So th this implies that, sorry. Um, well, in general, this tells you that a had genus of TM, the top part uh, is zero. Okay, so this is a topolo topological constraint. And this is a geometric constraint. Okay, so somehow we managed to relate um, geometry to topology using Dirac operators. Um, okay, uh, any question about the statement? Uh, yes, we have a question there. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, well, uh, the question is like, can you have uh, a hat non zero? Uh, I guess uh, uh, the question is like, well, the, the, by, this is the top class, so uh, by Poincaré, you know, the dual, the, the top class has to be zero, I guess, because it's a perfect pairing. It's like a one-dimensional vector space, the top dimensional, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, the lower dimensional, the Hayhat genus, really, it's, it's a lot of classes, yeah. they're not just, and those are, you, you, this doesn't tell you anything about those, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this only tells you about the, the, the combination of potential class in the top uh, dimension, yeah. So it's a, it's a linear constraint, uh, one linear constraint on your Pontryagin classes. Well, I guess it's not linear in the Pontryagin classes. But. Um, okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, let's prove this. Uh, it's, um, it's, um, it, it's integration by parts. Um, yeah, so that maybe I'll keep this here, uh, and I'll erase uh, this one. I guess let me call this theorem A. The proof of theorem A. Um, okay, so we show that, um, you know, uh, we want to show that the index of D plus is zero. The index is the dimension of the kernel and the dimension of the co-kernel. So, you know, the, the easiest way to show this is just to show that both those numbers are zero. Okay, so we'll show that kerd uh, uh, is trivial. Okay, and then, you know, uh, this contains kerd plus, kerd minus. Okay, and the in, recall index is the dimension of kerd plus minus dimension of curve D minus. Okay, so if you show this, then this implies that the index of D plus is zero. Okay, so suppose it's not zero. Suppose there exists 
phi which is not identically zero, such that d phi is zero. Okay, then we can use this formula here. So apply, let's apply this formula here. So, so d square phi uh, equals nabla star nabla phi plus scalar curvature over four phi. Okay, but of course, you know, this is d of d phi, so this is zero. Okay, so now, now we'll do our, uh, you know, uh, let's uh, take, we take, uh, I don't think I need this anymore, so maybe I can move. Um, sorry, let me check. Okay, yeah. So let, we have this formula, and let's take uh, the inner product in L2 with phi. Okay, so we have zero equals uh, nabla star nabla phi uh, phi plus L2 L2. Okay, um, but now, you know, phi is not identically zero, so it's positive, it's on, it's on zero at some point. And the scalar curvature is positive everywhere by assumption. This is where we use our assumption. Uh, so this term is strictly positive. It's an integral, and at some, well, and at some point it's positive. So this is strictly bigger than nabla star nabla phi, phi, a two inner product. Okay, so here is where we use uh, positive everywhere. You know, it can change, but it's positive everywhere. And now we can use, you know, by definition, nabla star, you can bring it as a nabla uh, uh, on the other side. Yes. The inner product of nabla phi. Nabla phi. So this is the definition of the fact that nabla star is a joint of nabla, so you can bring it to the other side, but without a star. Okay, and now this is an inner product of an element with itself, so it's non-negative. Okay, so we got our contradiction because there's a strict inequality here, and we have two zeros at both ends. Uh -oh. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, this is like one of the first instances, like probably the, the first instance in which uh, people realize that you can, you know, if you want to study uh, the relation between geometry and topology of a manifold, you can look at the uh, uh, Dirac operators. And, you know, the, the rest of this class uh, will look at some uh, more complicated examples. Um, yes. Um, but yeah, let me tell you, you know, this is a very nice theorem, but you know, it's, uh, well, you need the assumption that the manifold is spin. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, it's, it's too nice for you to expect to be, for it to be sharp in some sense. So let me just tell you a very simple example in which uh, this theorem fails. Um, yeah, so I guess the question, um, I guess the question, so I guess, Let's take that n torus. So this is just you know, Rn modulo a lattice, so z to the n. And because you know the, the matrix on Rn descends, so this has a has a flat metric. Hence uh, PSC metric. Uh, sorry, uh, scalar curvature identical is metric. Okay, you know, uh, you can keep a, to get the scalar curvature from the sectional curvature where, you know, you take all these traces things, so, you know, you, you, you get zero. Um, yeah, so I guess the basic question is, does P to the N admit 
a metric with scalar curvature always positive. Okay, so can you somehow bump the curvature up at each point uh, a little bit? Okay, so let me just compare this. Uh, so compare. So this is Myers' theorem. Okay, so this is a classical theorem in uh, Riemannian geometry that doesn't use uh, much technology, um, um, like ODE comparison. Um, but yeah, the theorem is that if you know if you have a, um, if M has a metric with positive Ricci curvature. everywhere, then the pi one of M is finite. Okay, so in particular, you know, what, what, what you show is that the universal cover uh, is compact. So in particular, the, the pi one is finite. So yeah, in, and it's very interesting that, you know, Ricci curvature, so uh, remember, scalar curvature is the trace of Ricci curvature. Um, but somehow this is much more, uh, you know, there's much stronger some constraints on, on this, uh, on, on having positive Ricci curvature. And, you know, people, it took people a long time to figure out constraints on the existence of positive scalar curvature metrics. Um, yeah, and of course the torus, you know, pi one uh, of torus is infinite. So no, uh, no metrics with positive Ricci curvature. Okay, and you know, our, our um, now, so let me write it here. So t, the tangent bundle of Tn is trivial. Okay, you just pick like the basis, the standard vector fields on, on Rn and they descend to a, a trivialization downstairs. Um, yes, yeah, so in particular, this tells me that uh, in particular Tn is spin and um, Tn is spin, and um, um, let's see, um, this spin, and uh, uh, well, all the Pontiagin classes are zero. Okay, so in particular also, uh, so the A hat genus of Tn. Uh, okay, so this constraint uh, doesn't apply to Tn. So the, the theorem we just proved doesn't allow us to conclude that uh, the torus doesn't emit metrics with positive scalar curvature. Okay, so I guess uh, the idea is that, you know, we've been looking at us, uh, so I guess th this is, I don't know, as a spoiler, next time we'll prove that the answer to this question is yes. Um, and the idea is that in this theorem, we looked at only a single Dirac operator, uh, but really there's a lot of Dirac operators floating around on a manifold, okay, especially when B1 is positive. So let me tell you a little bit, uh, so I guess this obstruction, you know, let, let me erase it because it's not useful for this more complicated problem. Okay. Um, yes, so, so theorem A does not answer. Um, uh, uh, the question. Okay, so to answer the question, you know, at theorem A, we, we look at a single Dirac operator, uh, but really, you know, as the title of the mini course uh, suggests, you know, the title is families of Dirac operators. So it's much better in general to not to just look at the single Dirac operator, but you can look at some families of twisted versions of, that's a question? Uh-huh. Oh, because, um, oh, the question is like, how do you conclude that the kernel of D is zero? Uh, well, if you have an element in the kernel of D plus, if you have an element in the kernel of D plus, that's also in the kernel of D, because it's a block matrix. You know, so it's zero, D minus, D plus, zero, 
and you know, an element, if, an, if an element in the kernel D plus has this shape. So then also the, you know, the yeah, but, but I guess by the definition of the domain, it has to look like this, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so the idea to study families of twisted Dirac operators. Okay, so what, what do you twist a Dirac operator with? So I guess I didn't really define properly Dirac operators. Uh, so I won't even define properly what twisting a Dirac operator means. I tell you, I just tell you what you can twist a Dirac operator with. Okay, so, um, so on M, so uh, consider, um, you know, we have the trivial bundle uh, on M, the trivial bundle. Okay, and we can pick uh, a flat connection on it. Okay, so you have a trivial line bundle, and we look at the connections on this line bundle. In general, there's a lot of them, uh, at least if you have some B1. So, you know, this, uh, these are in bijection up to, up to equivalence uh, with uh, the torus of flat connect. Uh, this is a H1 uh, of M with R coefficient modulo H1 of M by Z coefficient. Okay, and the correspondence is given by holonomial round loops. Okay, so if you have a flat connection, you know, you can holonomy transport things around loops, and you know, things will come back a little rotated, so that gives you a, a, a holonomy. And you know, a flat connection on a bundle is determined up to equivalence by its holonomy. So we have a lot of uh, uh, interesting flat connection on this trivial bundle, okay? Provided, well, this is, this is B1 of M dimensional. Okay, um, yes, um, yeah, and once you have something like this, you can create uh, the twisted Dirac operator, twisted by this connection, this is uh, the twisted Dirac operator. And this goes from the same bundle to itself. Okay, so we twisted our Dirac operator uh, by this flat connection B on a line bundle. Okay, so we have a big family of these uh, operators on the torus, for example. So the idea is like try to give up, take obstruction out of this big family of Dirac operators. Mm -hmm. And this satisfy uh, all things we said before. Uh, Same properties of the, Dirac, the standard Dirac operator. It's just a, a little twisted version. Okay. Yeah. So all, all the statements I made before about D uh, also holds for DB. Okay. Here you have to be careful. Uh, I'm twisting with a flat connection. If you twist with a non-flat connection, then things change. But you know, if you twist with a flat connection, then things remain the same. Yes. Uh, you, you'll find out next time, but the answer, yeah. I guess the answer is, uh, is no. Oh, sorry, the question is like, uh, is the answer yes or no? Uh, uh, well, the answer is uh, no. Oh yeah, we can, we can prove the existence of metrics using this technique, we can prove that things don't exist. So yeah, we'll prove next time at the end that things don't exist, that such a metric does not exist. Okay, let me just tell, you know, this is a very, abstract thing, or you know, have this operator that I didn't define for you, uh, and, you know, but going back to the original thing, uh, and, and then we twist it, but you know, uh, it's good because uh, everything can be done in a very concrete way, 
uh, going back to the, you know, at the beginning of the class, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's already been an hour and a half. But if you remember, I started writing down matrices and matrices, uh, you know. Uh, and yeah, you know, these twisted operators are not that much more complicated, uh, at least in simple examples. So let me just tell you the simplest example of this twisted Dirac operator. Um, yeah, so basic example. Okay, let's say M equals S1. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, yes, I get, uh, sorry, the question is like up to gauge, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess I said it uh, verbally, but maybe I'll, let me record it in written form, uh, up to gauge, up to isomorphism. Up to bundle isomorphism there, uh, classified by holonomy, yes. There's a question there? Uh, yes, the question is like, do they all square to the same thing? Uh, yes, because uh, it's a B is a flat connection. In general, if it's not a flat connection, you get a curvature of B term too. Yeah, but I guess in this, in this uh, mini course, we'll always work with twisted by flat connections. So the, the, the Lichnerovitz formula I wrote also holds for that. Mm -hmm. And you, used, you, well, you need to use instead of nabla, nabla B, I guess. That's the, the only thing, yeah. Um, yes, so M equals S1. If you remember, the Dirac operator was very simple. It's I, D, let's say, you know, this is coordinate X. This was I, D, and DX from, you know, complex valued function to itself. Okay, and these twisted uh, Dirac operators are not much more complicated. So, you know, M, I think of it as um, uh, R mod 2 pi Z. Okay, and then I pick an X here. Okay, the twisted, um, well, all connections on, uh, on S1 are flat, so we were, were uh, are of the form. Um, you know, up to equivalence, they have the form D, uh, I, D in Dx plus C. Okay, for C from C infinity complex number to itself, and you need to pick C uh, real number. Okay, so any of these turns out to be a flat connection. Oh, sorry, a twisted Dirac operator. And, you know, uh, really there, there will be an S1 family, and here we have a, a, a real parameter, but at some point they become the same. So, um, to, to uh, I d in dx plus c, and i d in dx plus c prime. You know, in general, they look like different operators, but, uh, well, if you think of matrices, there are like, you can conjugate one to them, so they're equivalent. There's a change of basis that brings one to the other, are equivalent when um, c minus c prime is in z. So this is a, an exercise in the, uh, at the end of the notes, if you want, there are some exercises uh, that, you know, should help you grasp uh, what, what's been going on in class. Uh, this is one of the exercises. So, you know, we have this family of operators parameterized by the real line, and they, they are the same when the parameters, the pa you know, uh, they're different by integer. So we have an S1 family of, of uh, twisted Dirac operators. Um, yeah, so I will end here. Uh, maybe, um, I guess I have two minutes, so, I'll just uh, mention a, a definition that I forgot to say. I guess this fact of having, uh, and I guess I'll say it a lot of times next time, so I guess it's good to, for me to say it. So we, we look at this Dirac operator, and uh, it has finite dimensional kernel and co-kernel, and those kind of operators have a name. So, and equivalent, like there's a nice change of basis uh, between of them. So if you, if you do a, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, at the, at the end of the day, this, they, they, they come, sorry. Yeah, sorry, the, the question is like, in which sense are these operator equivalents? Uh, well, you know, uh, they're equivalent meaning in the sense of matrices. So there's a unitary transformation that uh, carries one to the other. Okay, and at the end of the day, this is the same, you know, you can think of this somehow as a, some kind of 
this, this gives you a family of flat connection on circle, and they are equivalent exactly when this is uh, holds. So you have this S1 family of connections, yeah. But I think, yeah, the exercise asks you to think from the point of view of being equivalent as operators. Yes, there's another question up there? Uh, yeah, I might be, no, I think it's pi z, right? Sorry, the question is like, is it pi z, two pi z, or z? And I think uh, the question, the answer is, uh, I don't know, but I think it's z. I, I, I thought about it before writing, but yeah. Okay? Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's two pi here, so the, the Fourier modes are e to the uh, n z, yeah, so. Pi, I mean. uh, so There was a question there? Oh, uh, so the question is, like, is it obvious that the Dirac operator is Fredholm? And no, but uh, it, it's in general true from ellipticity. So uh, elliptic operators on a compact manifold are Fredholm between the right spaces, yes. Okay, I'm um, one minute over time. Can I take one minute to write what Fredholm means? Okay, so definition, so this. So next time we'll go deep into uh, more uh, no, algebraic topology and function analysis, how they relate. So this is a, a word that I say, instead of saying, you know, it's just a word to say finite dimensional kernel and co-kernel um, in, in a single word. So, so suppose you have H uh, a Hilbert space. Um, okay, so we'll always assume separable for us. Okay, and then T from H to H, a bounded operator, Uh, if uh, dimension of kernel of T and dimension of co-kernel of T are both finite. Okay, and we can define its index in general. Index of T is defined to be Okay, uh, yes, so, so here it's where I start to lie because the Dirac operator is not bounded and uh, there's a lot of lies, but it, you know, it's bad. Yes, Paulo has a question. Yeah, so the, I guess the question in general, if you have, uh, the question is like, do you need the image to be closed? Uh, that's automatic for Hilbert spaces or Banach spaces in general? Uh, it follows from the open mapping uh, theorem. Uh, but yeah, in general, if you, if you look at from operators between random topological vector spaces, you need to add the condition that the image is closed, yes. Yeah. And also, yeah, I guess to be, uh, at some point I lied to you, you know, the fact that the, the image of the, the orthogonal, the image of D is the co-kernel that also uses that the image is closed and that I didn't even mention that it's true. But it also follows from ellipticity. And it's a footnote in my notes. Okay, I think I'll stop here.